Every morning they go into the forest to hunt an animal that will be used as food. The Hotza language, called Hetzain by its people, is an endangered language isolate spoken in the region surrounding Lake Ayasi in northern Tanzania. Though it has persisted for thousands of years, threats to the future of the Hotza people are compromising one of the world's most distinct and ancient languages. The Hotza people, who call themselves the Hetzaib, are a culture of nomadic hunter-gatherers who live in Tanzania. Isolated through their remarkably steadfast tradition, they have changed little in 10,000 years. The Hotza have little if any access to antibiotics, agricultural products or modern sanitation, permitting researchers a glimpse at what a paleolithic microbiome might have looked like. They also live in a geographical region where our early hominin ancestors are thought to have emerged, making them an interesting study group for evolutionary biologists and anthropologists alike. Due to the Hotza's rigorous language use and strong tradition, Hetzain has an advantage over many other endangered languages in Africa. The Hotza people have proven to be an extremely resilient culture, persisting in isolation through the advent of pastoralism and agriculture. Today, however, land use issues and cultural diffusion present more of a challenge to the future of the Hotza people and their language than ever before. Here they have seen the marks of the animal, see how they are looking for the animal. The Hotza people provide an interesting parallel to the gut microbiome of those living in industrialist cities. By comparing the gut flora of these divergent populations, researchers are gaining an insight into how our modern lifestyle might be impacting the bacterial ecosystem within us. It is not easy to know where the animal is going and it takes time to track them. The Hetzeb are the last hunter-gatherer community in East Africa. Their practices have changed very little in over 10,000 years. They do not engage in agriculture or domesticating livestock. Instead, each morning, the men head out with their handmade bows to catch animals and collect honey while the women and kids look for edible plants and items such as fruits, tubers, berries, figs and nuts. The heads they hold back from wearing modern clothes manufactured in factories, instead, they rely on animal skins for clothing. The hunting trip continue. The Hotza people eat no processed foods, are rarely exposed to antibiotics, and live seasonally, eating more meat in the dry season and a predominantly plant-based, high-fiber diet in the wet season. In the absence of strong, industrial cleaning solutions, the Hotza are exposed to bacteria in their environment daily. This might partly explain the resilience of their gut microbiome. Loss of land to farming and wildlife preservation continues to threaten the future existence of the Hodza people. Nevertheless, Hodza are working with local NGO partners to secure communal land rights for all Hodza groups. Considering the Hodza have little access to modern medical facilities, they have relatively low metabolic and infectious disease rates compared to other groups in northern Tanzania. It is believed that this is at least partly down to the unique gut microbiome. Finally, they see something. The Hotza people are one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer tribes on the planet. Despite being a modern human population, the Hodza lifestyle and diet remain unchanged from their ancestors thousands of years ago, allowing researchers a unique insight into a paleolithic microbiome. Keep reading to discover how the Hodza microbiome compares to a city dweller and what we can learn from the differences.
After hitting an animal, the animal often runs away after being hit by an arrow, so they look for it by following the traces of blood. When the Hodza return to a high fiber, plant-based diet in the wet season, the levels of these species rise once more. This powerfully demonstrates that our microbiome is dynamic and plastic, reflecting both our diet and lifestyle choices. It also suggests that the changes witnessed in Western microbiomes are reversible. Surviving hunter-gatherer populations are the closest available proxy to a time machine we in the modern industrialized world can climb into to learn about the ways of our remote human ancestors. The Hotza numbered just over 1,000 people, fewer than 200 of whom adhere to the traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which includes a diet composed mainly of five items, meat, berries, baobab, a fruit, tubers and honey. While Western diets are pretty much the same throughout the year, the Hotza lifestyle doesn't include refrigerators and supermarkets. So the population's diet fluctuates according to the season, of which there are two in the Rift Valley, dry when meat, baobab and tuber consumption play a relatively larger role in wet, during which berries, tubers, honey and baobabs prevail.
Ba ai ala ba 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 Shoko ji, 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 shoko
Head Zeep tribe hunters have made it again. After hunting for a long time, they finally succeeded in finding a big bush pig. Headzape tribes are well known for the profound connection they have with their land, for their intimate knowledge of the natural world and the delicate balance they have maintained for millennia with the environment. Until about 500 BCE, Tanzania was exclusively occupied by hunter-gatherers akin to the Hodza. The first agriculturalists to enter the region were cosheteic speaking cattle herders from the Horn of Africa. Around 500 CE the Bantu expansion reached Tanzania, bringing populations of farmers with iron tools and weapons. The last major ethnic group to enter the region were Nilotic pastoralists who migrated south from Sudan in the 18th century. Therefore, groups such as the Hodza and the Sendo are remnants of indigenous hunter-gatherer populations that were once much more widespread and are under pressure from the continued expansion of agriculture into areas which they have traditionally occupied. In the late 19th century, European powers claimed much of the African continent as colonies, a period known as the Scramble for Africa. The Hadza became part of German East Africa, though at the time the colony was proclaimed there is no evidence that Hetzeland had ever been visited by Europeans. The earliest mention of the Hadza in a written account is in German explorer Oskar Baumann's Dutch Messerland Zoonokel, 1894. The Hadza hid from Baumann and other early explorers, and their descriptions are based on second-hand accounts. The first Europeans to report actually meeting the Hadza are Otto Dempwolf and Eric Obst. The latter lived with them for eight weeks in 1911. German Tanganyika came under British control at the end of the First World War, 1917, and soon after the Hodza were written about by British colonial officer F. J. Bagshaw. The accounts of these early European visitors portray the Hodza at the beginning of the 20th century as living in much the same way as they do today. Early on Obst noted a distinction between the pure of Hodza, that is, those subsisting purely by hunting and gathering, and those that lived with the Isenzu and practiced some cultivation. The foraging Hodza exploited the same foods using many of the same techniques they do today, though game was more plentiful because farmers had not yet begun directly encroaching on their lands. Some early reports describe the Hodza as having chiefs or big men, but they were probably mistaken. More reliable accounts portray early 20th century Hodza as egalitarian, as they are today. They also lived in similarly sized camps, used the same tools, built houses in the same style and had similar religious beliefs. <laughs> the British colonial government tried to make the Hodza settle down and adopt farming in 1927, the first of many government attempts to do so. The British tried again in 1939 as did the independent Tanzanian government in 1965 and 1990, and various foreign missionary groups since the 1960s. Despite numerous attempts, some forceful, all have largely failed. Generally, the Hodza willingly settle for a time while the provided food stocks last, then leave and resume their traditional hunter-gatherer life when the provisions run out, few have adopted farming as a way of life. Disease is also a problem because their communities are sparse and isolated, Few Hodza are immune to common infectious diseases such as measles, which thrive in sedentary communities, and several settlement attempts ended with outbreaks of illness resulting in many deaths, particularly of children. 
Of the four villages built for the Hodza since 1965, two, Idachini and Mangulai, are now inhabited by the Aisenzu, Iraq and Totoga. Another, Mongo Wamono, established in 1988, is sporadically occupied by Hodza groups who stay there for a few months at a time, either farming, foraging or to utilize the food given to them by missionaries. At the fourth village, in Demiga, also known as Mwaniem, the school is attended by Hodza children, but they account for just a third of the students there. Numerous attempts to convert the Hodza to Christianity have also been largely unsuccessful. Tanzanian farmers began moving into the Mengala area to grow onions in the 1940s, but came in small numbers until the 1960s. The first German plantation in Hetzeland was established in 1928, and later three European families settled in the area. Since the 1960s, the Hodza have been visited regularly by anthropologists, linguists, geneticists, and other researchers. In recent years, the Hodza's territory has seen increasing encroachment from neighboring peoples. The Western Hodza lands are now a private hunting reserve, and the Hodza are officially restricted to a reservation within the reserve and prohibited from hunting there. The Yida Valley, long uninhabited due to the Tsetse fly, is now occupied by the Tuga herders, who are clearing the Hodza lands on either side of the now fully settled valley for pasture for their goats and cattle. The Datuga hunt out the game, and their land clearing destroys the berries, tubers, and honey that the Hodza rely on, along with watering holes for their cattle causing the shallow watering holes the Hodza rely on to dry up. Most Hadzeb are no longer able to sustain themselves in the bush without supplementary food such as ugali. <laughs> After documentaries on the Hodza on PBS and the BBC in 2001, the Mangola Hodza have become a tourist attraction. Although on the surface this may appear to help the head save, much of the money from tourism is allocated by government offices and tourism companies rather than going to the head save. Money given directly to head save also contributes to alcoholism and deaths from alcohol poisoning have recently become a severe problem, further contributing to the loss of cultural knowledge. I'm <laughs> 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 Don't 